Shalom. It is your bipolar host with mommy issues, Keats Ross. And I'm here with the brilliant and beautiful Mary June, accompanying this little introduction on the Pinanner. It is my esteemed pleasure to introduce our inaugural Colorado episode uh, since we've relocated here in uh, sunny Aspen country. And I'm using this episode to present my conversation with the a culture author, documentarian, cut up conductor, Mr. Carl Abrahamson. Those of you not familiar with this work, but may have listened to this podcast, may recall Carl being half of the international jet setting, trans dimensional wayfaring duo that is Trap Art, a metaphysical media enterprise fronted by him and recent Prag Magic guest, Dr. Vanessa Sinclair. Carl, though, has been ever so present in the world of a culture. He literally wrote the book on it. And he's been a prominent fixture in both my artistic and magical whims, having been a frequent collaborator with the likes of Kenneth Anger, Genesis Peorage, and Anton motherfucking LeVay. Our talk couldn't have come at a better time as these things usually do. All hell chaos, all hell synchronicity. As I've been struggling to assess the current state of O culture, or what, if any, my place in this whole charade might be. And Carl, like I said, literally wrote the book on it. His oeuvre, his body of work, and his inspirational intent is decades-long fervent and prolific. If there was ever an episode to address and court the need for a multifaceted creative life parallel to one's wayward spiritual path as a seeker, it's this one. And it is my esteemed pleasure to talk to somebody that cares so much about all the facets, about all the interests, and the intention about what they do in both camps. So, without further ado, weirdos and witches, slither hither, it's my ap absolute pleasure to introduce Carl Abrahamson. Take it away, Mary June. Haunt on. Carl Abrahamson, so good to meet you finally. I feel like I have this uh, parasocial kind of relationship with you through your work. So it's very cool to meet you finally. Yeah, uh, likewise. It's just uh, amazing actually that uh, technology allows for such a, you know, easy and smooth way of communicating. Um, and uh, that's why, you know, I'm, I'm very much in favor of all these things. Uh, because of you know promotion obviously but also a conversation of building new kinds of networks that would simply be kind of impossible if this technology weren't here so I see this as a very very good thing yeah I and mean, that kind of brings me to my first question which is uh, it has a lot to do with a culture your book that came out a little over a year ago yeah and I wanted to get what your like state of the union is on what a culture has been since the publication of that book and where you maybe think it's going yeah no it's a it's a question that i think about often right. <laughs> perhaps not perhaps not daily but you know uh when you are uh as you say on social media and you sort of keep up with what, what's going on and you know it's not a matter of whether you want to see it you will see it uh, because of how the the algorithms work and the sort of keywords and stuff like that so what I can see uh, happening is basically a kind of continuing trajectory of like, you know, uh, events certainly in my life that led up to the publication of the book. And of course the book is not, it's maybe unique in the way that it puts things together, but these are much greater movements than my mere, you know, intellectual capacity. And, you know, just recently over these past days, I've seen, um, 
uh, stuff about the upcoming O-Culture conference in Berlin. And there was, I think last weekend, there was something called the Trans States uh, Conference in Northampton mm -hmm. that me and Vanessa were at, uh, I think, uh, three years ago. Um, so those are only two examples of things going on literally in the now. And they are not, I, they are not isolated uh, occurrences. There are, you know, these things happen all around the world. And as I've talked about before, it's a, it's a mix between um, the existence now of these, you know, all kinds of weird topics under the umbrella of a culture uh, within academia. You know, so the, you have these highbrow uh, conferences and loads of books being published about not so much about like the history of religion or comparative religion, it has to do specifically with esoteric things that we could call magic or the occult. Or these are just terms, but so that kind of um, presence in, an, in the highbrow uh, environment and also on a grassroots level, uh, because I don't think, for instance, that the occult festival in, in uh, Berlin uh, is academically based. It's more like a grassroots thing. Right. So, yeah, so it's um, wonderful. And me and Vanessa, you know, we had our latest conference in northern Italy in um, late May, early June. And that's another example of a, of a grassroots thing where we invite people from all these worlds and they are all welcome to uh, create this kind of, I don't know, a new kind of egregore, which we hope will remain very, very open-minded. Because that's a little bit of the challenge for the, the uh, academic environment, is that they have so much uh, formalia they have so many formal things that they have to adhere to. So that sort of decimates their potential of speculation. Right. And I'm, I'm very much in favor of speculation. Every empirical you know, breakthrough comes from speculation. I agree. Yeah. And yeah. that kind of brings into my next question, which was you know, about adversity and about how maybe there's a bunch of rhyme and reason between a lot of the occult renaissance that happened you know, in, the, in past eras, mm -hmm. but it seems like this one is lacking somewhat of a um, adversarial degree with the social consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that was, if you noticed that, if that's like something you see, think is lacking almost, because it seems like magic comes from desperation in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And it seems like with the advent of it being so easily reachable and community so easily made, maybe, I don't know, I, what your uh, observation is with that. Yeah, I think uh, here we come to the, the crux or the, the sort of problem of, of definition, you know, what is it? And I, I usually use this cliched thing, you know, the occult is like hidden things, but that's historically apt and correct. But I mean, what is it today? You know, right. it's a com actually a completely different thing. And so hence, I think we have lost the need for adversity, you know, identifying with the adversary like satan in a way or, or lucifer uh, that's all fair and fine but it almost you know requires some kind of romantic notion right also histor a historic romantic notion so i don't think that the you know this thing adversity or an adversarial principle is necessary for any kind of occult uh, contemporary movement or groups or, or mind frame uh, for that to thrive maybe it's actually uh, surpass that simple, uh, simplistic dualism. And I think that what we have today, uh, you know, with this kind of technology and uh, the ability to reach a lot of people and also the ability to be very, very creative with technology that wasn't accessible like a couple of decades ago. So I think we have a much more proactive potential that the adversarial principle is kind of redundant. Right. You know, why, why would I feel the need to go into combat with, you know, evangelical Christians? Right. It's just a waste of time. Yeah. You know, they're their own worst enemies. Uh, so in that sense, I think this is the best of all worlds, actually, because we can just be super creative. And if someone wants to engage in some kind of fisticuffs, you know, this, you know, why, why even bother? Yeah. And that goes within the, the occult or the occult community too. You know, uh, who, who gives a shit? You know, it, it, you know, life is too short. We have the stuff that we feel that we need to uh, be preoccupied with to fill us with joy and meaning and all these things. 
And that's usually the case with people who are very, you know, actively looking for some kind of, you know, uh, cock measuring in a way, regardless of, of gender. Uh, it, it leads nowhere. You know, uh, people should just focus on being proactive. And again, as your uh, podcast and concept is so, you know, beautifully called to be uh, pragmatical about it, to use, you know, pragmatism uh, in this sense, because we are not confined. We are not, you know, uh, in debt to any kind of tradition or anything. It's like a, being in inside a, a circus in a way. If we don't like this ride, we'll just move on to that ride. And eventually when we come out of, of, uh, the thing we will hopefully be satisfied and have had fun and ex experienced meaning. So in that sense, I think we have left. I mean, everybody leaves history every second, but we in this cultural or occult community, which doesn't exist, but as a concept, we have already left history behind and there's no need for it other, you know, except for us like romantic fodder or inspiration. Right. But I think in terms of magical, you know, technology, it's kind of redundant. Yeah, it almost seems like um, it's moved Meaning, more of an individuation process. You know, like yeah. the adversarial aspects are so, um, you know, by user, by participant. It doesn't need for this big yes. group think adversarial thing. And I wanted to get into that a little mm. bit with your time in Topi, uh, the Temple of Psychic Youth. Mm -hmm. How, as someone that has tried and is still trying to kind of formulate an art collective around magical practice and trying to get into that liminal space, mm -hmm. um, how, how did you get such individualistic minded, you know, practitioners and artists to convene? How did you guys come together and what were the pitfalls of that? Mm -hmm. uh... I think that, um, first of all, uh, everything uh, in my recollection, you know, my experiences uh, within Topi and, you know, Topi Scan, the little Scandinavian thing, and then Topi right, right. Europe, and all, all these things, uh, was based on a very genuine sense of uh, exploration, of course, uh, but also honesty, and there was no... Uh, like uh, pyramidal structure, no hierarchy in any traditional sense. And also everything was um, uh, kind of an, a nice constructive feedback loop going on. The essential part of that kind of networking, you, you received something and you sent something back. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was already a culture, a culture of, uh, you know, encouraging postal services <laughs> because this was before the internet. Uh, but that kind of flow of information already uh, created a sense of trust. And of course, you had the magic of this. If you're thinking specifically about uh, the sigilizing and creating sigils and sending them in, and um, that was uh, today. I think many young people are already kind of jaded. On, on a superficial level, because right. they already know everything in their in their mind. Meaning they have you know gone to Wikipedia and read about Austin Spear and you know, but that's not the same as as actually working with the process. And the beauty of the sigilizing process for those uh, like myself who are like willing to give it a try, you know, because you could then get Spare either in like uh, original editions that were you know very very expensive or some. Uh, anthologies that were sort of cheaply made but they had the textual information anyway so that being activated in this community of uh, you know very pleasant positive exploration and honesty also the regularity meaning that you know on the 23rd at 2300 hours etc we did this thing more or less together or in parallel regardless if we were in the US or in Sweden or in London or wherever so there was that sense of community and you know you didn't have to share it with anybody but the concept as such individuals doing something together uh, not to uh, you know have a communal goal that was the case in some instances uh, but for yourself to try this process of being so exposed and creatively uh, experimental not only for its own sake to create a change 
in the outside reality. Uh, and I think that many of those people, or again, like myself, found that to be a very, not just like a, an uh, inspiring thing to do, but it did change things. And then you can come to the, this you know, dichotomy. Is it in my mind or is it actually an outside reality? That's also kind of redundant uh, question because if it fills you with meaning, because you see enough results out there, you know, meaning I would like for this to happen. Oh shit, it happened. You know, right. that's em empiricism in its most valuable uh, uh, way. Um, so I think that when that was already rolling, beginning with very few individuals in it, you know, in the sort of inception of Topi, uh, then. Um, that kind of inspiration that was radiating from the process and from these individuals, mainly via the art that they were producing, like in music or films or or writing, um, it was kind of an you know infectious environment in the best possible way. It was an inspiring um, environment, and it basically came from this core experimentation. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. It's still there, uh, and uh, there could be many you know. Uh, rebootings or people could work with it on their own uh it's interesting when when things are you know in the past uh, they have a tendency to become mythologized and right. i i very much look forward to the documentary that's being made about uh, topi um because that will give people uh, young people specifically very substantial fodder about what it was about so that they can go beyond um you know perhaps a bit again, romantic uh, mythologizing and see to who were these people and what did they actually do? And of course, why is it so inspiring? Right. It seems like the threadbare has always been intent. And I remember you, you've spoke before about how each piece of art that you make, there has to be a reason for it. Yeah. And I was hoping you absolutely. could expand on that because I, I absolutely agree with that. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that uh, I come from a background, both, you know, personally and socially and stuff like that, which is, you could say, cultured. Uh, my mother worked at um, an art gallery for like 40 years and my father was interested in music and, you know, so I've grown up with a lot of um, sort of neurotic artist types. <laughs> uh, and what's changed now uh, <laughs> over the past uh, decades is, of course, that um, it is no longer about uh, catering to or allowing a fairly neurotic person to be creative and express this neurosis. That's really what makes for interesting art. Now we've also had the infusion of the postmodern concept of, you know, uh, having to explain what you're doing and seeing too that it fits within these uh, prefab politically correct models and all of this absolute bullshit that that you know and it it's so off turning i can hardly go to a contemporary gallery or a museum because it's so you know uh, basically it, yeah it, it turns me off so if you reason like that and you're also interested in in uh, magic and art in a historic sense then you get to this sort of initial uh, primordial times you know when people started being creative why were they creative? They were trying to appease or diminish their own fear because they didn't understand all of you know uh, what the universe was about or even their close environment, what that was about. And you know, the sun disappears or there are threats in the forests, and we need to you know uh, hunt a few more things. So they started creating art in in a way to to you know bring this forth to the outside reality. So you see the connection with ritual and with magical thinking and with desire and also survival. That's a very important concept. Today, there's like nothing of that. Uh, it's all superficial. It's all intellectual. It's all uh, left brain in a way, at least when it comes to the presentation, the formal aspects, meaning, you know, how something is designed is sometimes more uh, important than the idea. And I, I think that that's uh, wrong. Of course, I can't say that to an artist who is totally convinced that he or she is an artist and has gone to art school and all these things. And that's not my function. Uh, I don't really want to be involved with other people and be, you know, involved in this kind of discourse either. However, 
when it comes to my own creativity and also I know that's true for for Vanessa and and for many other people it's like the formal aspects are very very secondary they are completely subservient to the content uh, to the core of uh, signal I like this thing with right. signal and noise yeah. today's contemporary art is filled with noise it's like nothing. Where is the signal? And we want to uh, hone in and present as much signal as possible. Meaning, what do we want to see happen in the outside world? Let's present that in a creative form. And voila, that's art for us. And that's basically what we're doing in, in many different uh, forms. Could be traditional forms like making music uh, or writing. Uh, but it could also be like experimental things like, you know, the cut ups and cutting things up and putting them together randomly right. and seeing what's there. But always, even in the most frenzied experimental joy to have a core desire or will in there um, to make it, um, you know, talismanic. Right. To charge it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm. Uh, maybe then postmodernism is the adversity <laughs> that we all uh, yeah could share. be but even that yeah no absolutely that could be one thing saying that you know what is this crap but right. then again it's much more constructive to just leave it behind and let these goofies you know uh, live in their little dream world which is just ultimately filled with frustration because when I know so many young artists who you know, go to art school and they're so happy about being there and maybe it's a good art school or a well-renowned art school, but when they come out of that experience, you know, they have, they're in debt, <laughs> student loan debt, and they have to think about things like sustenance and they will become victims of this uh, shark infested uh, environment, which is the art world, you know, where you have uh, reviewers and you have, gallery people and you have people who, who buy and sell your art and that's a very tricky thing because for instance if someone actually has a successful show and make money off of that do you think they will then go the direction of further experimentalism and possible no sales or will they stick to the you know the groove that's already there i would say that you know 90 percent would stick with a comfortable groove of just presenting more of the same and, and uh, you could then argue, well, that's magical then because they want the money, sure. But it's, they could equally well be doing that by selling socks or working as an accountant. <laughs> right. So there's no creative challenge Yeah, it involved. Almost, and I think there needs to be. It almost seems like, um, you know, pretension is such a bad word or, you know, mm -hmm. being pretentious is such a, it's such a scoffed at, you know, terrible attribute for an artist but, or even maybe a magician. But it seems mm -hmm. like that is a major thing that we're losing, um, especially in, in modern yeah. art. It seems a little bit too laissez-faire, you know, kind of art for art's sake. And there needs to be more yeah. attention, maybe a little more pretension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or simply ambition in that right. sense. Because, you know, uh, I say pretentiousness is sort of misguided ambition in a way. Because mm -hmm. most of these people have a great mm -hmm. zest and gusto and you know great energy in their they invest a lot in their their work and life but sometimes when they can't really uh, separate from from uh, the art and they try to express their genuine artistic process with intellectual discourse then then it becomes sort of it misses it misses the goal in a way and i right. think we could blame this also on um our culture in a sense because we're so accustomed and now programmed even to be visible you know we have to be visible on social media and everything we do whether it's like having lunch or or uh, you know clipping our toenails need, somehow needs to be out there uh, and that, it's a strange culture uh, but i think it also um, uh, hinders people to take a minute and take a moment off and just go into a more meditative state and say that, you know, where am I heading with this specific piece of work, like a sculpture or something creative? And uh, it's not necessary to flaunt it at all. Right. Even, you know, there are many people, many artists who, who are not on Twitter, they have successful careers anyway. So it's not really necessary from the market's point of view it's a kind of a program that we have received over this past decade 
um, that you know makes for this incredibly you know narcissistic and uh, flaunting culture right. but it's not necessary to the creative process in itself it could be good as you know additional marketing that's how i look at it there's some you know like new thought type uh, aspects to that too almost uh, creating accountability for yourself by posting and uh, you know playing this fake it till you make it thing so you know with that there there may be some good that can come from that but yeah <clears throat> it seems like a very uh, disgruntled way to um, you know share in the process of creating yeah it becomes you know uh it's it's a kind of a shallow thing right and and but you know also what can never argue i mean there are incredible success stories and i, mean, I feel you know uh active enough uh, both me and vanessa we you know try to inform about what's going on not like every single aspect of every single movement but at least um uh, keep people in the loop uh, because we are producing a lot of different things. So, of course, we want people to be aware of that. So I see that's more like a, an informational uh, flaunting. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, you have an entire culture on a, on a higher level, or if you, <laughs> maybe it's a lower level, but I mean, financially more successful level, like, you know, anything from the Kardashians or MTV or, or, or this thing where it's nothing. It's a presentation of absolute nothing. And, and that's highly, highly... Um, lucrative because the representatives of nothing uh, can market themselves in many different kinds of environments in which you have a, a financial uh, revenue coming in and it's it's kind of remarkable because it's, it's never been like that uh, people used to be somebody and then you could have a glamour but now the glamour in itself itself comes from mere visibility and frequency and it, it's, a, it's a weird thing, but it's also something to be looked at from a magical uh, level. Uh, we, of course, don't need to or couldn't adapt to being nothing since we are something. Right. But, but the, the strange thing is that, you know, if this is a mere causal process, it's like, you know, you do the Twitter thing and then you do this and you sort of analyze it from uh, an almost scientific uh, behavioral point of view, then, of course, you could have a greater outreach and that could be good for the something. That you have so that's where I am at now I'm sort of uh, ambivalent in a way but I'm trying to learn more and more about how it could be integrated but only in the promotion right. never in the artistic or creative process in itself because that's something that's in here it's, you know, it's like you know when it come out, comes out as writing yes there is an intellectual filtering but it's not intellectual for the sake of being in an environment that sort of requires it because that would be like prostitution in a way. Right. Yeah. I mean, you... And no and, offense to, to prostitutes. Right. Uh, I was just going to say, you and your wife, Vanessa Sinclair, um, I am yeah. just so astounded by the level of productivity and insight and cross-medium creation. And I wanted to get a little mm. glimpse into what a day is like in your guys' creative lives. <laughs> yeah yeah it's um we try to be structured in the sense that uh you know we're, we're early birds and we get up and you know have breakfast and then we both work on uh things that have requires mental presence and intellectual strength in a way so we usually write in the mornings up until lunch work on actual writing not like correspondence uh, but just creative writing i mean we're both working on new books and and that's required it's very hard to write a book because i i know that some people can just you know sit in a coffee shop and and uh, uh, write away i can't do that and and uh, so we try to stay very focused in the first half of the day and then of course lunch and then i usually drift into uh, administration of uh, life and business and creative project and then in the evenings uh, I usually drift into a different kind of creativity which could be for instance music or movie making like editing films and working with the film projects because right. it's just a different kind of energy that's required and then Vanessa of course works as a psychoanalyst so she has patients uh, that requires uh, also a different kind of presence from her so 
ideally, this is how we, we structure uh, our days. Uh, what usually uh, disturbs that is the uh, traveling. <laughs> we, we travel a lot, and, and that is sometimes, uh, uh, I wouldn't say counterproductive, because it leads to new kinds of creativity, but it's hard to maintain that strict, rigid uh, uh, workflow that we both love. Um, so yeah, that's just our life filled with those kinds of challenges. But essentially, we uh, cooperate even on the things which are uh, our own. Like, you know, Vanessa helps me with stuff and I help her with stuff. And then we also work on the things that we have together, like, uh, you know, the music and the cut-ups and, and uh, some of the films. So it's just a very uh, interesting um, life. And I mean, I'm very happy about having found someone that I can, I don't feel a need, I, need, I, I don't feel a need that I have to explain anything. You know, it's it's just all out there in the open. And we look at things like um, everything is potentially creative. And I love where things become, uh, should I put, wow, that's someone calling me, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. <laughs> uh, uh, how everything could be potentially creative in that sense. Um, uh, and I think these films or I would call them projects that we have been working on this uh, past year or years is a very interesting thing where we could have like a text where there's something that I have written or someone else. So we have various like source texts. Then Vanessa cuts them up and records herself reading them. I then put those readings to music. So we have like an album. And then we turn that album into a film using the same kind of, you know, cut up or free flowing experimental attitude. And then you have a film with that stuff. And like recently for the most recent one called uh, Mementeros, which is kind of, you know, erotic. We had a show in Zurich, meaning an exhibition mm -hmm. based on uh, screenshots from the film that Vanessa then added further stuff onto. So they bec become like, uh, original artworks so I like that constant flow of things um, which is uh, kind of limitless without boundaries and um, uh, again working with these things it's very very stimulating we have sometimes a hard time going to bed because there's so much to do and stuff <laughs> like that uh, but it's a very rewarding uh, life on many levels it sounds like it. Yeah. Um, I was wondering too, it, you know, you talked about your process a little bit just then, but what are some of the magical practices you guys kind of employ behind the art? Because one of my biggest uh, interests is that confluence between art, the artistic process and ritual or magical uh -huh. practice, uh -huh. uh, you know, prag magic in that way. And I was wondering what, if you could share some of you yeah. guys' uh, different techniques or magical practices yeah i think uh without becoming like too specific right because uh i sometimes feel that that, that can actually be counterproductive when you want to inspire someone because right. then it becomes like a little uh, not, not a cult but it becomes too specific and i for one uh, and that's uh, like an an inheritance from the topa days is uh, i would only encourage people to be very pragmatic <laughs> pragmatic and then also work with uh, creativity because this is important uh, many people think that okay to be a creative you have to be some kind of artist and you know uh, or have the vocation or the, the desire to be you know to be an artist uh, but I don't think that's the case at all I would just very on a general level recommend people to be creative regardless if they have any you know, talent or anything because these things and you know what is it it could be like writing could be like making collages or making music or cut-ups or painting even although you perhaps can't paint that's besides the point uh, the main thing is to make an external representation of something you have on the inside because that's basically how you define like you know the magical cave art, the first uh, poetry, the first songs, even people dancing for a specific purpose. It's a symbolic representation in an exteriorized uh, form. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that really sums up magic in a way. So if you imbue that uh, externalization with intent, 
that's that's magic for you. Right. And the reason why I think the creative processes work so well is because they're not structured according to our, you know, uh, left brain rational way of thinking. And that, for me, in my experience, is one key why it works. Because if, you, if you're strictly rational, you are thinking in a causal way. You need a cause that leads to an effect. And that's fair and fine for existing in, you know, the causal reality. But magic uh, has to do with the subconscious. It has to do with irrationality. It has to do with specific, you know, right brain things. Um, and the intuitive usage of these creative components. Um, and I mean, collaging is a great way of, of, um, uh, of being involved with that because you have uh, source material that may come from stuff that you've chosen rationally, but then when you cut it up and you re-affix, you affix these parts in a new way, perhaps using the print, you know, random, let them fall where they may, I don't know. And then you put it together to create some kind of aesthetic thing. Uh, that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. And if, and here we come to these complex things like uh, faith, for instance, I have faith in this process. I know it works because I have experience of that. So I invest more into it because it's a method that works. Meaning these things that I do, whether it's like, uh, uh, recording one of my texts or my poems and setting that to music, uh, then it becomes more than poetry and music. It becomes, for instance, uh, a uh, declaration of intent or a curse or, or something that's more in the, under the magical, specifically magical umbrella. Uh, and I think that uh, the main thing, how you learn these things, is how it works for you. So you simply have to do it. I mean, it doesn't take, it's not rocket science to have a, a pair of scissors and some old magazines and making a collage and then thinking, what do I want to imbue in this specific thing? Because it's my aesthetics, my choice of choosing this picture and this picture, and I could discard that picture as being irrelevant for this working. So you just have to work with it. And the, my... Uh, the expression that's dearest to my uh, self is, of course, writing. You could do a lot of things simply by writing. You don't even have to cut it up. I mean, if someone is uh, somewhat well versed into, you know, the craft of, of writing, you know, take a love letter, for instance. A, a well written love letter is a magical ritual because it will hopefully uh, get you the result of. Uh, uh, <laughs> getting a sort of some kind of love back uh, for that. Uh, but then, of course, you could also delve into more irrational things where you use text you've written and you cut them up, as we often do, uh, and see what, you know, as Barrow said, what they actually mean. What do these, what do I mean by writing in this way? And that so, process yeah. uh, opens up for, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, there's this constant thread between a lot of the guests I have and, and talking this very question. And there's divination and randomness in a way. And it's, uh, you know, I've heard it used uh, to get people out of, uh, you know, writing holes. I've, I've heard it used, to, you know, for everything from advice, you know, it's divination. You're using uh, just the random, yeah. you're, you're organizing chaos in a way. And so I've always really appreciated yeah. that. Mm. No, it's absolutely uh, super important, and I think that uh, one should one shouldn't look at it as some kind of pseudo religious thing either. I know so many people who work at it from a like strictly Barosian right. point of view, and you know you can't edit and you can't cut off things, but of course you can. I mean, it, it's not him running the show from you know from beyond. It's how we work with these things, and I mean I have. Uh, a recent experience of this is that I'm wrapping up my second novel right now. So, uh, and I, I didn't feel a need to include a cut up, but there was one section where there's a kind of a supernatural dreamlike state. And there was a kind of transmission to the protagonist. Um, and there uh, I, I picked some things and I cut them up and made a sort of semi edited version. Uh, and that fit in so well. And that in itself took, the narrative onto 
uh, a different direction than I had originally intended. So as a creative tool in itself, it's remarkable. And as we know, for uh, simpler texts like lyrics and poetry, I mean, uh, Bowie used a lot of cut-ups and his lyrics are really um, catchy, in both in the pop sense, but there's also something there that draws you in and it's, it creates a kind of an uh, irrational glamour. You know, what the hell is he singing about? And why, am I, why do I like it so much? You know, it, it's a skill. You can hone those qualities and your, your uh, creative capacity when it comes to that. But it's when, when you get the hang of it, then you should just uh, definitely use it in every possible way. I like that, not uh, being dogmatic about any kind of process whatsoever. It kind of goes back into no. your, um, you know, one thing I've always took from you and what I've really liked about what you, what your thoughts were in this whole charade of life is that you shouldn't mm -hmm. be scripted to one influence and you, you've always been big on individuation and, you know, carving out your own process, taking from many different things, almost like cutting up influences. Mm -hmm in a way yeah yeah absolutely i think that uh, that's also something uh, that is interesting because uh i've been fortunate in the sense that i headed out into the world uh and i was always a networker and that meant a lot to me so uh even before i became interested in uh hocus pocus and sort of started networking uh, <laughs> about magical things and you know being involved in actual groups or orders i was already doing the same kind of thing but with music because i was always uh, I'm, I'm addicted to producing printed matter so i had a fanzine which was all about music you know garage rock and uh, b movies and that kind of culture uh, so i met a lot of people uh, that i looked up to you know like stars and you know i thought they would never take 15 minutes to, to stick around with me and answer some questions for the fanzine but my experience was actually the opposite that most people who are you know good people who make good things uh, are very accommodating and that might not even be for the sake of of pr because you know does it really matter if some fanzine with a circulation of 500 copies write about your record i don't know but, uh, you know, uh, that opened up a kind of a pattern in my mind that I then applied on my then, uh, you know, uh, growing, increasing interest in things Hocus Pocus. And that led me into, you know, meeting uh, Genesis, of course, and LaVey and Kenneth Anger uh, early on. And that meant a lot to me. Like, it's a fuel that I'm still uh, feeding off on. You know, and, and with Jen, for instance, it's a, a still active friendship and we're still working on things to this day. I mean, it was only a couple of months ago when uh, our new record together came out. So right. it's never really ended. It just keeps fluctuating. And, and in that sense, what I want to get to was that uh, you can, of course, find inspiration wherever you have your favorite writers or your favorite bands uh, and then if you feel a need to then you can you know stretch out a hand to that environment and see if it's more productive or could be counterproductive to actually be in the proximity of those people who created it sometimes i'm sure it doesn't work so well uh, but it doesn't need to be that kind of super glamorous star thing it could just be people that really inspire you try to figure out and question why is it that he or she inspires me so much and those things that you find out will be things about yourself not about those people and then of course that could be uh food for thought and and little you know bricks in the building of your greater house in a way right pillars and building a big structure yeah, I totally get that. I mean, the reason why yeah. I started this podcast was for this very reason. So I really appreciate you being accommodating to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're passing. Yeah, it along, no, that's so that's just. The, but that, yeah, that's that's the beauty of it, and you know that that's exactly how it works, and it's exactly how it should work. You know, it's just. Uh, and here we come into other, you know, things too, like. Uh, holistic thought or some kind of psychedelic culture where it's just everything just morphs along and there's nothing that anybody could do to stop it ever because it's just like you and i are 
uh, we are currently uh, hosted by these two bodies that we have and we're communicating with each other and we can understand each other but it also affects other people so it's just the, this steady stream that it comes from somewhere you know and it's surely going somewhere <laughs> it's right. beyond our control so all we can do is like we can pseudo control the moment and be give as much signal as possible and that's a great thing i think yeah no that's you know that's exactly what i meant um and as we're winding down i uh i had just like a personal question for someone uh such mm -hmm. as yourself that has worked with the likes of ken anger and anton levey and uh you know genesis p orage um what are you finding are the like thread between all of you guys as thinkers or luminaries within this realm what are some attributes you guys all share mm -hmm. i would say that's a kind of a, an easy thing to answer because uh, all these people may be different you know they have different right. traits and different you know character characteristics but uh, it's the persistence uh, and I don't really mean that in some kind of, you know, peppy uh, American way, you know, never give up and be <laughs> the best you can be and all these sort of uh, slogans. But persistence is very important. And the thing is that uh, I think many people uh, trip or stumble on the fact that they can't reach where they want to be immediately. It's also part of our culture, unfortunately, which is credit based. And I've written about that, too. It's like... Uh, it works best in a magical economy that you work and you create things and then you sell it da, 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 on a symbolic level rather than getting it all at once and then having to pay it off. That works for a regular economy too. It's kind of unhealthy. So I think that persistence where you don't look too much to the ultimate goal because that may be an illusion. Uh, and also you change in life so that the, your vision and your goals may change. But the main thing is to be true to yourself and have that persistence that uh, this may not be the right path, but I'm sure as hell going to stay on it and see what comes out of it. So there you have the sense of experimentation, uh, of uh, audacity, and of uh, basically trusting yourself and your intuition. Because when we grow up, as we all know, it's so easy to fall into these prefabricated traps uh, or settings or grooves that other people have created for us. And it's not that they're evil. They're just part of uh, perhaps a non-individuated environment where people don't even think about these things because it's too painful or too advanced in a way. So I think that uh, trust yourself and then you uh, work with yourself and you will find out, of course, eventually, if you're true to yourself, what you like to do, what you don't like to do. And sometimes a simple dualistic analysis like that is all it takes to get you started. And then there will be a lot of magic because when you're on your way, you have these things like, you know, union synchronicities. And right. that's like evidence for me. Synchronicities are evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and you meet people that you never thought that you would ever meet, but you do. You know, life can be a wonderful, magical miracle. Uh, but the outside world isn't going to impose that on you. It will come from you and towards the outside. Well, Carl, I really appreciate this talk. Um, what's on the horizon? What's, what's coming up? Uh, the horizon is... Uh, so filled with things i can hardly see it <laughs> it's it's i'm working on uh, on my my novel like i said that's uh, the thing that brings me the most joy of all that kind of consecutive writing and writing fiction specifically so that's going to be fun that it will hopefully be something that comes out next year then uh, and then um, the uh, documentary about anton lavey uh, which is also very close to uh, being finished. So that will actually be out later this year. The first screening is, uh, thank you, it's November 21st. And uh, it's it's uh, the biggest film I've ever made so far. Uh, so it's been um, a while in the making, but it's, it'll be interesting because it's sort of, uh, I have, I place higher demands on myself in terms of quality. And this is also something 
uh, I respect LaVey so much that I really want to make a film that he could feel proud of too. That I make, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I present him in a just way, uh, do him justice, make him justice. Uh, because it's so easy for these people who are, you know, uh, public media figures to be um, uh, portrayed in a very, very bad way. And I mean, I know that he figured in American Horror Story, I think, and I haven't even watched that and I have no intention of watching that. But it's so easy to fall into that trap. And I would, I just want to present him as my experience of him was very, very creative, very generous. And it has nothing to do with the hocus pocus or the, the, the Satanism or, or the magic in itself. It has to do with that person's transmission, not only towards me, but also to other people who knew him during this, uh, his last decade. So it's going to be more of a personal film. Um, and then, of course, me and Vanessa, we're just rocking and rolling uh, and producing new stuff, new music uh and uh, writing yeah jet setting too yeah. uh globe trotting and <laughs> vanessa is working on a book about uh, like uh, art history from a uh, psychoanalytical lacanian point of view mm -hmm. uh which is very interesting and then you know it never ends it's not over till it's over so we're just going to be very disciplined and keep working on all these things and it's it's uh, going to be great yeah real quick where Thanks. is the uh premiere for the film in November? The, pre the premiere of the LaVey film will be in Copenhagen oh, cool. because I have a friend there, he runs his own little uh, cin cinema. Uh, and, but of course there will be American screenings too. Uh, it's just that we I need to finish that film uh, when I'm home. I'm in the US right now, uh, but home is Stockholm in Sweden. So right. that's where I'm gonna wrap it up uh, during well, during the month of October, basically, and then start some promotion and hopefully as many screenings as possible. So anything that you know or other people know, if you know someone with a cinema or a capacity to arrange screenings, you know, feel free to get in touch. Because I, I want yeah. it to be uh, widely seen. And I think it's a, to a topic and a person who, who uh, people are very interested in, curious about. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm a big fan of trap art. Uh, big fan of both you and Vanessa's work and thank you so much for showing me the time and being accommodating and uh, you know uh, yeah. let's not this, thank you let's not have this be the last time no 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 it won't be the last time and I'm so in favor of what you're doing also and Vanessa says hi and it's just uh, one great uh, beautiful magical party uh, on the internet and in real life and everything so <laughs> Just keep up the good work and we'll talk soon again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Carl. And hello, Vanessa. Have yeah. a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That was my uh, just incredible introductory conversation with Carl Abrahamson. I implore him to come back because it's always good to get these initial introductory uh episodes out of the way when you first meet someone that you admire you first meet someone that has uh really helped kind of shape your viewpoint about things that uh, mean so much to you it's nice to have them reoccur so that the bubble has popped we can get on to the finer details with things and that said the special surprise uh, next episode, I will be having Mr. Mitch Horowitz back on the program to talk specifically about Satan himself and to touch a bit about depression and metaphysics, a confluence that I care very deeply about as I have used metaphysics to help, how would I put this, to... Uh, to construct or to calibrate my uh, intention as both a human and as an artist and as a magician. And I put air quotes in that for those listening. Um, so if you have any questions for Mitch Horowitz concerning the great adversary himself, Lucifer, uh, please Twitter me. Handle is at pragmagic underscore cast. You can become a patron 
find unedited episodes and lots of other goodies, music, records, zines at patreon.com slash pragmagic. And as always, haunt on. Beautiful, boo.